scripture this morning comes from the second chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galilean? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pomphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. One, of the, one of the perks of being the lead pastor is that I can delegate to Pastor Justin and Pastor Bernie, the difficult scripture readings, like the one uh, that uh, Justin just read. But he did it w very well, did he not? Yes, he did. <laughs> and Pastor Bernie also, at the 9 o'clock, he did as well. What does this mean? They ask on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit and his power was given to the followers of Jesus, and the church was born. And we've been asking that question ever since. What does it all mean? For the 120 gathered in that room that day, uh, and for the first recipients of Luke's record and his writings of the early church, about the early church, Pentecost means 50th, 50th. Uh, and is the second of the great Jewish festivals observed on the 50th day or seven weeks after the Passover celebration. In the Old Testament, Pentecost is called, the festival of Pentecost is called the Feast of Weeks. Uh, it was an agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural festival uh, when the people, most of which who grew their own food, brought the first fruits from the crops and offered them to God an offering of thanksgiving, but also a petition and a prayer up to God that the rest of the crop uh, would prosper. But for the Jewish people, Passover and Pentecost was not simply celebrations. Passover and Pentecost helped them recall their story of the exodus from Egypt. When God was moved by their suffering and heard their prayers and heard their cries and rescued His people, the Passover Passover, 
was the event when lambs were sacrificed and the blood of the lambs was painted on the doorposts and the lintels of the doors of their homes. And when the death angel saw the blood, he passed over the homes of the Israelites but slew the firstborn of the Egyptians. God led them from slavery out of Egypt uh, that very night. Uh, then passed, uh, they passed through the, the Red Sea into the desert. And then 50 days after the Passover, after that Passover event, uh, they came to Mount Sinai where Moses received the law and the people of Israel became a nation. What does it mean? What does this mean? Pentecost, the 50th day, as the 120 in the upper room and the first century Jews understood it, wasn't just about first fruits or the beginning of the harvest. The day of Pentecost is about God honoring the promise he made to Abraham, fulfilling his, uh, fulfilling his side of the covenant, and giving them the way by which they were to carry out God's purposes in the world. Now that was the backdrop for the day of Pentecost. They were celebrating the day of Pentecost. Like most Americans, we know our 4th of July celebration is more than just hamburgers and fireworks and patriotic music. We know the meaning behind the celebration. We know the framers risk everything, and men and women made the ultimate sacrifice to win our freedom from a tyrannical king of England, and a nation was born. So Luke assumes that his readers didn't need a quick lesson about the meaning of Pentecost, and he takes for granted his readers see this event uh, of the 120 followers of Jesus being filled and equipped by the Holy Spirit to tell the story of the resurrected Jesus and win 3,000 souls on that day as a sign that this is like the first fruits, as, uh, as the beginning of the great harvest. But this time, the harvest is men and women. And they understood the connection between uh, their deliverance from, from Egypt and 50 days later, becoming a nation to carry out God's purposes in the world. And what happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. They made that connection. What does it mean? What does this mean? The meaning of the Holy Spirit arriving on that day of Pentecost is for the transformation of the world with the power from heaven. With power from heaven. Starting with... Those 120, uh, those 120 minds and hearts and lives, uh, the, the, that remnant of, uh, of uh, who, uh, who followed Jesus. And the arrival of the Holy Spirit on that particular anniversary of the day of Pentecost uh, to this day of Pentecost, celebrated by the Church of Jesus Christ around the world, invites and encourages, compels us to to let God's Holy Spirit enter our lives and our hearts and transform us from being tepid believers into, into people whose hearts are on fire with the love of God. But according to data from the General Social Survey of Church Membership and Attendance, released a few years ago now, According to the data, non-Catholic mainline denominations in the U.S., including the United Methodist Church, are in the midst of a decades-long decline. And the decline has intensified in recent years. The data showed that less than 1 in 33, um, that's probably more or less now, it's probably worse now, the statistic is probably worse, this was released several years ago, but the data showed then that less than 1 in 33 of our neighbors or our work associates, uh, maybe even our family, um, don't attend a mainline church, or 1 in 3 do, uh, 1 in 33 do, 33 don't. Uh, and if the decline in the U.S. continues at the same rate, the projection is that mainline non-Catholic denominations will cease to exist in 2039. Now, if that statistic is accurate and continues, which there's, it appears that it is, 
What this means is we have 17 more Easter services and 17 more Pentecostal Sundays uh, before most of our churches are closed. And this, this, by the way, this research was done several years before COVID. And COVID has helped to exacerbate the decline and death of many already unhealthy churches. Many are just closed because of COVID. Now, how did we get from that day of Pentecost, where God gave His Holy Spirit to the church, to where we are today? How did we get from 120 followers of Jesus, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, communicating the good news in ways their neighbors could understand it? How did we get from Peter standing and addressing the crowd, saying, we're not drunk. We may be drunk a little bit later in the day, but we're not drunk now. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, No, this is what the prophet Joel rightly predicted. In the last days, God declares uh, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, who was handed over to you and whom you crucified. But God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in death's power. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How did we get from 3,000 souls being baptized that day After hearing the gospel message from Peter and the others saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How do we get from from those who were added to the church, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and breaking bread uh, uh, and, and, and praying together? How do we get from the day of Pentecost to a declining church of Jesus Christ in Europe and the United States? Well, one theory posed to us by one theologian and author is that over the past several decades, mainline churches have abandoned the central tenets of their faith because, he says, we've decided our testimony What God has done in our lives, our testimony, may come across as offensive or inconvenient in our day. Or, listen to this, our testimony, what God has done in our life, is inconsistent with modern culture. Paul wrote to the church at Rome and said, listen, don't. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Mainline churches have abandoned central tenets of our faith. Tenets like, for instance, that Jesus actually died for our sinfulness. Like, for instance, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Like, for instance, that Jesus' death and resurrection uh, uh, makes our dying souls alive again. Like, for instance, that Jesus is not just a good person who suffered unjustly, but that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. If mainline churches have a future, they will need to engage more deeply with the day of Pentecost, where 120 of Jesus' followers who were collectively and individually recipients of the, of the death and resurrection of Jesus, who were filled with His Holy Spirit uh, and with an urgency like their hair was on fire. Oh, wait a minute. It was on fire, wasn't it, according to the reading, or close to it. Uh, um, uh, like, uh, like the continuation of civilization depended on them. They shared the gospel in a way that their neighbors could hear and receive. But herein lies the problem, evidently. We've abdicated our ability to personally communicate the gospel to others because we don't want to seem pushy or offensive with, our, with what God has done in our life, with our personal faith. And we've relinquished our individual voices, our testimony to what God through Jesus has done in our lives to a bland and toothless message. 
I know, you may be saying, listen, Peter was the one who stood and, and preached that day, so you do your job, pastor, and let us be, let us be. But the Scripture says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. The Holy Spirit gave each person hiding in, listen, they were actually hiding in that room, fearing for their, still fearing for their lives, but the Holy Spirit gave them the ability and the courage to get out of that room, come out of hiding, and speak in other languages, other dialects, other languages, because on the day of Pentecost, the mass celebration, the festival day, there were people in Jerusalem observing the festival of Pentecost for, from many nations and who spoke many different languages. Last Sunday, we recalled that Jesus told his disciples that, 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 that he would come to them. Uh, he told them that he would ask the Father, and the Father would send them another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would remind them of the things that Jesus had taught them. And, and the last thing he said before he ascended into heaven is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And with that power, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth literally, literally means those 33 acquaintances in your life that does not know Christ. It literally doesn't mean that, but it actually does. After 50 uh, and 50 days after his resurrection, 10 days after his ascension, the promise of the Holy Spirit was realized and Peter and John and the disciples and a small company of followers received the Holy Spirit and the power to be witnesses, and the world was turned upside down for Christ's sake. What, what does it mean? Now, chances are, when the Holy Spirit comes to fill your life and heart with His presence, your hair won't catch fire or won't be singed because fire is lighting above your head. Chances are the Holy Spirit's not going to give us the ability to speak in other languages. Uh, however, we can, we can learn to do that. There's a, a lot of neat apps and programs that help us learn. But the Holy Spirit, if we will allow our hearts and lives to be open to His presence and to His leading, will help us also find the courage and the words. The Holy Spirit will enable us to find our voice to be a witness to our faith. Listen, if our salvation is optional... <clears throat> Uh, and the world we live in doesn't really need the coming kingdom of God, then we may as well just stop fighting against the inevitable and close up shop and go home. But if there's an urgency, if the world that you live in and that I live in needs the transforming good news of Jesus Christ, if our children and our neighbors and this community needs this church to be an influence in their lives for Christ's sake, then let us receive the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in this church and be His witnesses in our world. If the Holy Spirit can enable a fisherman and a tax collector and a zealot and a doubting Thomas and an assortment of ordinary men and women and probably children who were in that room with their parents on that day to set the world on fire for Jesus. Surely the Holy Spirit can empower you and empower me to effectively share our faith in a very broken world and with those who so desperately need to hear. And because He is the Lord of all, He has provided the power to do a new work in Christ for all of us who follow and for all of us who put our trust in Him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.